Miami-Dade College is an incredible institution for economic mobility, and I would ask uh, that all of you uh, make it a goal today to find a Miami-Dade student, they're all over, or talk to Dr. Pedron, <coughs> um, and find a way to give somebody their first chance, uh, because my first chance made a huge difference uh, in my own career. Um, I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm going to read to you from my own newspaper today, because I think it speaks to what is happening right now, and it speaks to our moment. Uh, above the fold, page A1, Belt and Road Property Boom Stalls as Beijing Tightens Reins. A global real estate boom fueled by China's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative has slowed to a crawl as Beijing seeks to rein in rogue building projects around the developing world. So, we are globally awash in investment capital. We are awash in wealth. We are awash in savings. Um, if you work in financial markets, you find yourself constantly talking about the search for yield. What that really means is there are people who have saved money who are looking desperately for some kind of investment that will provide a return. Uh, those investments are getting harder and harder to find. And yet, it is easy to identify infrastructure needs, worthy projects uh, that will provide a return over the long term. We can identify them in the United States, we can identify them in Europe, we can identify them all over the developing world. Um, Capital markets are supposed to accurately take wealth and funnel it towards the right kinds of risks, and we can see a mismatch there. Uh, at the same time as we identify this mismatch, um, there is a shift in the source of investment capital. That's something that we see with the One Belt and Road Initiative. There's a, cis, there's a shift in the, uh, in the sources of bailout capital, right? There's something we got comfortable with over 75 years of Bretton Woods that is no longer the way things are done. Uh, in the world. Um, at the same time, there has been a massive shift in the technology used to extract oil. Um, that story starts in the American West. It's an incredible story of innovation uh, and technology and capital. It shifted the price of oil. That's had consequences for economies all over the world. It's had consequences in Russia. It's had consequences in Nigeria. It's opened up investment projects all over the world. And yet, at the same time, we are starting to see the consequences of climate change. And so that's another challenge where we have this incredible opportunity to make energy cheaper, which as we know, uh, is a driver of development. It's incredibly helpful. <coughs> and we have a challenge of figuring out the right compromise between that cheap energy, which drives development, uh, and the consequences of it. Um, so. Uh, all of the panelists asked that we not go into too much detail in their background. We have an extraordinary collection of people to speak to uh, all of these. Um, I'm going to introduce them quickly because I want to get to the first question, um, which is everybody is going to take a look at what they see as the risks uh, in the world. Uh, to my left is Enrico Letta, uh, the former prime minister of Italy and uh, currently the dean at, the, at uh, Sciences Po. Uh, Frank Fannin. Uh, his card says Francis, but he asked us to call him Frank. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for the Bureau of Energy Resources the U at the U.S. Department of State. Um, Ibukun Awasika is the Chairman of the First Bank of Nigeria. Uh, Jose Luis Man Manzano is the President of Integra Capital. Uh, and Alan Yang as the Chief Investment Officer uh, at GLP. But uh, Enrico, let's start with you. Where do you see the biggest risk right now? Of course, my point of view is a, a European point of view, so uh, my first point about Europe is the fact that we are living in the period of the three P paradox in Europe. We are at the best in terms of peace. We never experienced such a peaceful period within the European Union. <coughs> the best, the top in terms of prosperity, the second P, we never experienced such a prosperity uh, uh, in the continent, and the third P, we are in a period of enormous pessimism. That is very complicated to uh, mesh together, because peace at the top, prosperity at the top, and pessimism at the top. This is why I think, at the end of the day today, the big point for us, for the Europeans, is how to rebuild confidence, how to rebuild trust, and how to create optimism for the future that is related first of all to the fact that we are uh, we we had two main crises that the u.s didn't have in such a, a i would say hard way the the financial crisis because the, the european one was too long and the migration crisis i mentioned this point of migrations because 
for many uh, important European countries, uh, like for instance my country, Italy, but also mm -hmm. for Germany, the migration crisis was a, a crucial point. So my answer to your question is the fact that we in Europe, we are living in this period of pessimism. Uh, the big problem is uh, today uh, is a problem of uh, governance. We have many problems of governance. I think Brexit mess is the demonstration of that. Uh, when I say governance, I, I would like to use just a, a, a slogan, an image that can be uh, useful. The fact that our real lives are 5.0. Economy, industry is 4.0 and the decision-making process in political terms is 1.0. <laughs> and it's very complicated to have this very different, uh, I would say, uh, is very fast when it's for your life, for economy, and very slow and very complicated in terms of governance. And my final point is about, um, my, I, I see a, a big trap for us, that is the weakening of the transatlantic ties. I mentioned this point yesterday evening. I would like just to end up on this point and, and, and I raise uh, this point as one of the main engagement of this forum too. Miami is, 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 uh, is a, we say, is a crucial place where to say that because the world needs to have a very strong transatlantic solidarity. And we are experiencing mistrust, uh, misunderstandings, uh, there's not uh, the idea to be responsible together for the future of the world, and the world's future needs a strong transatlantic uh, cooperation. So my, my conclusion maybe is to say that we have to be, from here, we have to say how big and how important for the global risks we are, we are experiencing or we are towards us in the world, this transatlantic commitment and the relationship between Europe and the US, first of all, is so important for the future. Yubakun, where do you see the risks right now? <coughs> okay, if I start from Africa so I can give a balanced <coughs> our view. Well, we have the youngest population of the world, more or less, in Africa right now. Uh, they've never been more educated than uh, you can imagine. The world has closed in, so what um, someone in the same age group in America and Europe is seeing is exactly what my young African is seeing at the same time. And that generates ambition and drive and vision for the same things. But the environment of opportunity and the infrastructure to exhibit that opportunity is not available in the same way. And because the nature of man is to seek the opportunities that they're driven to, uh, that they aspire uh, to become, ultimately you would end up with the kind of movement, migrational movements that we're seeing between Africa into Europe and South America into America. Uh, we still have um, the challenge of leadership that is behind the curve in terms of the vision and the ambition of the population. So we have an ill-equipped leadership for the continent in terms of the things that uh, we can do. And um, the world is moving towards um, protectionism and we're trying to de disengage from uh, globalization when the ships move a long time ago and it's impossible to reverse it. Easy example, a plane crashes in Ethiopia. You could listen to the news and think, oh, that's an African problem. Except that there are something countries of the world involved in that one crash. And across the continent, you would see a lot of young Europeans and young Americans working with young Africans to create businesses, trying to solve uh, the problems of the continent in terms of engaging our, our people. So it, it's... Um, the biggest challenge, as I see it, is we're losing the will and the commitment to build an equitable community that works for the entire globe. There is, we're building fences, and we want to live in mansions whilst our neighbors live outside hungry and naked. It's not a world that can work. 
It's a world that we can deceive ourselves will work in some ways. And I think the best example is if you ask our leaders on our continent, we will make money live in mansions but leave the people poor. You soon find out the day the people wake up that you can't survive except they survive. So really, we look at um, the challenges of the environment. And if a cyclone takes off in South America and causes so much destruction, there are people from different nations of the world who live in those communities. Ultimately, one problem at one end of the continent will travel to another. Ebola would start in Africa, but it would come into America or anywhere else. So it's really how we get the right kind of leadership that has a global mind. Because now we're trending towards leaders that have shallow mindset, who are very narrow in their view of the world, and who have no capacity to help articulate a world that works for all of us. That is our biggest risk right now. And because in doing that, there's a large followership of what I called unenlightened, unenlightened electorates who take their cue from that kind of leadership that leads the world in a different direction. And because I always thought the systems and the institutions were very strong in certain democracies, but the last few years has made me question just how established or how driven politicians in power are to do the right thing in the face of the true challenges to the system. Mm -hmm. Because self-preservation is at play in political uh, power situations and is ex extremely expensive for both the economy and the development of the world, as I say. Thank you. Thank you. Frank. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me here. Um, so I think the question was the biggest risk. Yeah. Uh, so what we do at the State Department, we look at the, the intersection of where energy plays in foreign policy. And when, when countries lack affordable, reliable energy, it creates uh, a headwind on progress and, and in fact, uh, it contributes oftentimes to significant political instability. So that creates security issues for us. So our focus is on on kind of the energy security dimension. Uh, our biggest, uh, what kind of the biggest risk that we see is, is how energy is used for malign purposes around the world. Energy uh, is foundational and, uh, and it's also a source of revenue. Uh, and so uh, corrupt actors often uh, look to energy as a way to uh, line their own pockets or coerce and control other countries. Um, Right here, of course, in, in our own continent, um, we have the situation in Venezuela, uh, and uh, where you know PDVSA at one time was the, kind of the shining star uh, in terms of the, the, the national oil companies. Uh, when Maduro took power, they were producing about 2.2 million barrels. Uh, when the United States imposed sanctions, they were roughly less than a million. Uh, that's that was that was done because he's looting the government, the, looting Petabesa, that one shining star, sacking the, uh, the, the real engineers, the real uh, competencies of that, of that company, installing his cronies, stealing the, 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 the revenues uh, while he gets quite fat while his people starve. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's an absolute tragedy. Uh, and so what we're seeking to do is to be cutting off the revenue. No more revenue is coming from the United States. It's going to go to, 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 to the regime. We, along with over 50 other countries, support the legitimate uh, interim president, Ron Guaido. We call on all countries to do so. Um, we also call on all institu international institutions. I mean, his government, Doro's government is illegitimate. Uh, we cannot have uh, usurpers representing a illegitimate government in institution, international institutions. And we're very pleased to see that the Inter-American Development Bank recently uh, recognized uh, the, the interim uh, legitimate government on, on, on their board. Um, so that would be one of the areas, is how energy <coughs> is used for malign ends to coerce uh, and, and maintain power call on all companies and free-thinking countries to, to join us and, uh, and look for the day when the Maduro regime is no longer there. Thank you.
Jose Luis. Well, first, thank you for having me here. I will uh, have a regional view from Latin America. <clears throat> uh, I'm from Argentina, but I think there are three or four risk factors that are shared in the, in the region, and I think they spread out to the rest of the world. Uh, interest rate, the China-US relationship, the risk of populism in the countries, and the risk of war inside countries or between countries or among countries. I will go short on each of them. Interest rate will have a huge impact. You know, the, the, the Fed monitor interest rate looking at US inflation, but the impact in emerging markets is much bigger than in yeah. US. So it's kind of a call that when policymakers in the US determine interest rate, and I know the mandate of the Fed is only to look for inflation and maybe on the side employment, the impact on emerging market is huge. The fragility of emerging markets and Latin America toward interest rate in the US is huge. So two point of interest rate will do the Chinese the biggest favor in history. Uh, the second thing is China-US relationship. Uh, the tension and the trade tension that the US economy suffers with China is much bigger in the small countries. The small countries face a fake choice on where to lean. Why I say it's a fake choice? Because it's not a real choice. When you look at trade, uh, you, should not, you, you don't have a chance to choose. You have a lot of trade going to the US and coming from the US, and a lot of trade going to China and coming from China. So the countries can do little yet unless there is a general policy of determining how to engage with the China factor. It has to be a set of rules and it has to be transparent. It's not it's a big risk of creating recession. The third one is populism. Populism is all over the place. It has cultural roots and it has social and inclusion roots and it has to do also with the new way of communication through social networks, fake news, 30-second uh, debate on deep issues. And I, I, don't, I don't know how you can debate 30 deep issues on 140 characters or 30 seconds. I'm not that good. I'm not that good. But countries do that. Last one is the risk of war. Uh, we all celebrated, I believe we all celebrated the <coughs> election of President Duque. <laughs> President Duque won a very transparent election, big popular support. Uh, we had the expectation of Colombia, President Macri, President Piñera in Chile creating kind of a lighthouse for sound economic policies. And they got a bomb in the police school three weeks later. And the bomb was done by internal guerrillas, but you should not be a genius to think the guerrillas have some connection to Caracas, no? at least some communication to Caracas, at least some friends in Caracas, some safe haven on the other side of the border. So there's a risk there inside the countries, but it's also a risk at the border between Venezuela, Colombia, and Brazil. Colombia and Brazil are two democracies. They are supporting democracy. They are receiving Three million people. Three million people sound like the Middle East. This is totally new for our region. Three million people abandoning one country for economic reasons, political reasons, or humanitarian reasons sounds like the Middle East. This is an import of Middle East uh, collapse, failure state into Latin America. This is totally new. I know young, I never seen it. I know Jan, I never seen it. This is something totally new. So it, is, it means that you always can go a little further down because we never dealt with three million migrants. Uh, so these are the risks. The risks are clearly identified. I think some of them have treatment. Some of them are more difficult, but if, if the job was to identify the risk, these are the risks. The risk is we isolate. The hope comes from dialogue and communications, but I think it's for, that's for the next question. Alan, please. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, I will. 
I guess, bring the perspective of a global investment firm to the conversation, and Brendan, what you're saying about investment opportunities and yield and the challenges in finding that are true um, <clears throat> from my perspective. But um, as a company that's focused on one singular bet, which is to invest in the infrastructure to support uh, global commerce uh, and a more seamless, transparent, and borderless commerce, um, you know, we are sitting at a point in time where uh, with the advent of technology and e-commerce and the infrastructure surrounding all that trade, um, the global economy has the potential or is already as vibrant as it has ever been. Um, and this technology, the introduction of technology, the declining cost of technology presents a tremendous opportunity to enhance that globalization. I think what the other panelists have hit on um, is going to be a similar risk in my, from my perspective, and that is that uh, this march towards globalization um, and what I think is a more efficient and seamless economy uh, can be hindered or disrupted by um, trying to manage the acceleration of this commerce through technology. So what I mean is different countries, different regions, are able to accelerate their involvement in the global economy through technology at this point. And while that's being managed um, in the private sector, whether it's being accelerated by the private sector or being managed by the public sector and policy, um, there's a tension at play. And <clears throat> as that tension unfolds, um, what we risk is over-rotating and derailing um, this I think more efficient commerce that is possible and the opportunity that is available to all these countries at an individual or regional or at a global level because of the availability and declining cost of technology. And so we continue to invest and try to promote that. Uh, we believe the demands of the world um, ask for that. Uh, but in this environment um, where it's unclear how quickly these different economies can accelerate and evolve. Um, it is being managed through a lens of, you know, some of the things Jose Luis said, uh, a lens of mistrust. So the protectionism, um, the populism, the trade wars, and ultimately, you know, veils of war, these things uh, create a, a lot of uncertainty in what would otherwise be, I think, a very positive environment for the global economy. And, um, you know, it is, it is important for leadership to understand that that would be the best outcome and the best route for the global economy and to try to engender that trust amongst each other. So um, that's kind of the risk we're facing uh, in my mind right now. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, a bunch of questions, but I want, um, if we're doing this right, we're having a conversation. So if at any point anybody wants to jump in, just, you know, give me a sign. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with you, uh, Ibu Kun. Um, one of the things that just came out of all the panelists uh, is the question of how do you take energy and use it for a, a wealth of energy and use it for the right purposes. Uh, there's the concern that in a country like Venezuela, it's of course been used for malign purposes. Um, if you take a country like Nigeria, it's been used for good purposes. You have this wealth, you use it for development purposes. Um, but I think that there's a lesson there, there's some experiences that you've been through that are relevant to everybody, which is that when the price of oil dropped from above 100 to briefly in the 20s, within a year, um, a lot of countries went through a shock and realized that wealth creation through energy is going to look different in the future than it has in the past. What were the adjustments that Nigeria had to make, and what are the lessons for the rest of the world? Okay, well, I, I think one of the things we hadn't done so well uh, as a country is um, we hadn't preserved the earnings from the oil when we were at the top of the, uh, when the price was right. And that's always related to government and which government and all of that. Now, over the last few years, we've had um, a few resetting, trying to make us be more accountable or better organized in terms of harnessing the resources for longer term value. We've set up our Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, I had the privilege of serving on the inaugural board of that uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund. And while it's slow and we could have done better if we started this like so many years ago, like in Norway, but we started. So that's something to start from. And 
Also, the other thing is because we have what I call a more prudent government right now, and they were the one in power at the point of that shock, uh, they did a few things right in terms of resetting the mindset of the country and a major drive to diversify the base of our economy from dependency on oil. There's been an aggressive uh, investment in building agriculture because we have massive arable land and, we, and with a population of almost 200 million people, we have the capacity to make agriculture a major part of our resource earning uh, asset. And before we found the oil, we were a major agricultural nation. We had a lot of cash crops that we earned our income from. So we're going back to those times. But there's also uh, a real identification of the fact that oil is a dwindling asset in terms of the way the world is. Everybody is trying to find an alternative to oil right now. So whether you like it or not, you're not going to sit there and think that this is one thing. We have a lot of it, but in reality, we've got to find how to use the talents of 200 million dynamic driven entrepreneurial, you know, very passionate people that Nigerians are and create other values from within it. So our young people are being structured. Our educational system needs massive rework, but there's a lot going on in terms of developing entrepreneurial hubs. And uh, we're getting quite a bit of help from within and from outside because a lot of smart young Nigerians are developing technology solutions and businesses that are attracting a lot of foreign capital into the market. And both ways, we think those can create opportunities in, in many other ways. There's also a major drive for entrepreneurship across the board because we have a massive youthful population. About 50, 50 to 52% of Nigeria is made up of people under 35. So you have a burden population between 18 and 35 who are coming through universities and all of that and you don't have the jobs for them. The only way you can create jobs for them is by creating businesses. So there's a massive drive for entrepreneurship in different areas, services, products, uh, and all of that. And uh, a serious drive to provide the right infrastructural environment on which that entrepreneurial drive can be built. So, do we have the right formula? We have some good ideas that are being implemented. Um, will it work for us? Ultimately, if we have the consistency of what this government is doing and the government after can continue, if we can maintain the interest of Nigerians because we have the natural abundance of our entrepreneurial drive, if um, we stop the chain of protectionism and the whole world understands that you don't want a country like ours to fail. You have 200 million people. If you release Nigerians across the world, the whole world is in trouble. As it is, there's millions of Nigerians everywhere else around the world, and they are adding a lot of value. But the whole world benefits from if Africa works and nations like Nigeria within Africa work. So the oil is a starting asset because it generates such bulk capital even now, but turning that into an asset to create bigger assets within the economy, looking at what are your comparative advantages and all of that, and correcting our infrastructural gaps, which, by the way, even if we sold all the oil, it can't meet our needs right now. So that's what shows you why we can't lock the doors, because you mm -hmm. still need capital to move across the world into areas where opportunities exist. The kind of return you can make investing in opportunities in countries like Nigeria, you can't make it in America. There's just no room for that. But, but you set out an extraordinary challenge for the rest of the panel, which is how do you help countries like Nigeria keep Nigerians home, that to yeah. be a part of a dynamic economy in Nigeria, and so I'll ask the same question uh, of Enrico as I will of Secretary Fannin, but I'll start with you. Um, uh, how can the U.S. help? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, first, I'd like to <coughs> applaud you on the, uh, yeah, sure. <coughs> Hello? Okay, uh, yeah, I'd like to recognize, I mean, establishing a sovereign wealth fund, making real energy reforms in countries, um, those can be challenging. Uh, a lot of countries who are resource rich have a have a long history of, of having heavily subsidized energy prices and, and the responsibility, uh, responsible uh, management of those resources can, can face some political headwinds. Uh, so well done. Um, I, I guess I'd like to first say, 
you know, how the U.S. energy uh, abundance was realized. It was realized uh, not because of U.S. government federal dictate, but creating this entrepreneurial enabling environment. Um, U.S. energy abundance was, of course, there's good rocks around the world where, where people will invest if the above ground conditions are appropriate. And the U.S. has the right mix of above ground conditions as well as the, the rocks. Um, you know, in 2005, Congress decided that the federal government would not regulate hydraulic fracturing. It was an exercise of restraint. In 2015, the federal government decided they, they would lift the oil export ban. And more recently, the, the administration has put through a, a streamlining process to a, allow for liquefied natural gas export. Now, what does that mean? That meant that in the last two years, the Permian Basin of Texas added an additional two million barrels of oil. That's Nigeria's production. Uh, they're currently producing four million barrels out of the Permian Basin in West Texas. That's more than UAE. Uh, you start playing out what happened. Uh, in 2016, when the U.S. just started exporting liquefied natural gas, we were the 15th biggest exporter. This year will be the third in the world. Uh, it's creating those enabling environment. And what, is those, what are those lessons learned? So what we're doing about it. Uh, we provide a variety of support to countries to help them create the uh, appropriate above ground conditions so that they can chart their own energy development pathway however they see fit. We're not dictating what type of energies we're, we're, we want to help empower. And, and it's important, as, as, as you had mentioned, uh, people want to stay home. They want to they wanna realize a future at home, and so we're doing that around the world. And, you know, in the Indo-Pacific, for example, where 60% of all energy demand will occur through 2040. I mean, this is tremendous. You have this level of dynamism that's occurring there, ascending middle classes who've never existed. Uh, I think uh, the, we talked about the risks. These are the opportunities, and, and we're partnering with countries around the world uh, to help them realize their own path. Prime Minister, the, the, the same question. Um, you, you've been part of a group that's looked at uh, migrants coming into the European Union and the possibility of sort of sharing that responsibility. Uh, it tends to be the country where they land, where they, where they have to be integrated and thought about. Um, Europe, from the outside, it looks like, has been discussing this in a defensive way. Mm -hmm. How do we figure out how to keep them out or how to manage them when they come in, even though we've tried to keep them out? Um, how do you manage that in a, how do you think about that in a, in, in, in a more, more productive way? What can Europe do uh, to, again, answer that question? How can you make sure that there's an entrepreneurial environment in Nigeria to keep Nigerians in Nigeria, productive and happy? What is the thing that Europe can do there? Uh, your point, I think, is, is the most important one. I, I will say something that will surprise, I think, the panel and all the audience. The fact that in my country and in many European countries, if you take today the two main worries, among the people, these worries are at the same time immigration and immigration. So Italians leaving Italy and going to uh, uh, London or to Paris or to the US, mm -hmm. to Australia, young Italians mm -hmm. or young uh, Spanish people or young Eastern uh, European people leaving to go to, uh, to other countries and at the same time immigration. So, the true point is the fact that with today's mobility, with today's new technologies, uh, part of the world like Europe, in which you have, you, you have to know, you, you know, you are completely aware of that, but the big difference between Europe and, and, and the rest of the world is that within Europe, you have 40 capitals at half an hour plane distance from each other. So you have 40 flags, borders, army, histories, all together, and you can move from one to each other in half an hour. So it's a, it's a mix that is very complex to live in. So my point is that the only way to give an answer to this very complex question, how to, to manage at the same time the fear of immigration and the fear of people leaving your country, young people, because uh, my, my 
daily life in Paris University is to work with young Italians mm -hmm. coming there to study, asking me to talk, and asking me how can I come back to Italy? Because it, it is impossible for me with all the skills that I'm having here. So my point is about the fact that the big difference between Europe and China in this very period is mm -hmm. that you're completely right. European leaders talk with African leaders only in a defensive way, only to say how to stop immigration. Chinese leaders are talking with African leaders in terms of investment. And that is the big difference. And we are losing there. We are losing the big battle of the world today and the battle of world of tomorrow. And, and my big point is about the fact that on migration, Europe was in a defensive way because we are not able to have one place where to discuss all together. So on migration, Europe is a, is a, is a place where you have four and 24. The four are Italy, Greece, Malta, and Germany. So the countries more affected by the problem in terms of first entry or final destination, Germany. And the other 24, less interested because it's not their own first problem. But at the same time, we need to have a central point of decision. That is the key, the key problem for everything. We were, at the end of the day, were performing on uh, foreign trade, on monetary policy, because we had two people at, at, at the European stage. One is Mario Draghi, the, 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 the mm -hmm. leader of the ECB, with all the powers and implementing these powers for uh, the European Union as a whole. At the same time, for foreign trade. For other issues like migrations, mm -hmm. we are 28 with veto right for anyone, and it doesn't work. This is why my conclusion is we are in a period in which governance problems are the main problems. And that is the demonstration of, so of this panel, because we are here, the International Economic Forum of the Americas, and we are talking on identity, politics, and everything. We are in a period in which, and is the big difference with 10 years ago, where at the end of the day, identities, politics, are the main uh, concerns of the people, and we have a lack of governance that is, for me, the main problem today. I mean, it's actually fascinating for me, speaking yeah, as somebody who... Oh, please, some, jump in. Okay, j just to say, I mean, one of the maybe bright spots, um, Macron came to Nigeria sometime last year, and part of what he was seeking was to find uh, a connective point between, the two, between France and Nigeria as a way to address the issue of migration. And he took it heads on, went everywhere, young people, old people, businesses, everything. And at the end of the day, he set up what we call the Club of 30. There are 15 of us Nigerians and there are 15 French people who represent different industries and all of that. And um, we're meeting aggressively, trying to work together to find an economic uh, model that helps to keep people at home, but empowered and engaged and all of that. And it's a starting point, yeah. because in reality, honestly, the average African would rather live in Africa. The food in Europe does not interest them. The cold, <laughs> it's true, the cold is not exciting for them. The culture doesn't allow the African man to stand like the African man and makes it difficult for the African woman because in, in Nigeria, I could have so many nannies and helps and aunties and all, because it's a different culture. So frankly, nobody wants to leave their home. The reality is human nature will seek for food, for shelter, and for prosperity in any way. We have a world where with environmental impact, there's desertification, there's lack of opportunities. There are real life issues that is driving people across borders. And when they get there, they add value. We can argue about that. I mean, I could start from an African perspective and say, Europe cannot even say they ignore Africa because a lot of resources from Africa built a lot of nations and human capital has added a lot of value. But that's not the point. The point right now is we have a challenge. We're too close to ignore. If you get to a point in Morocco, you could cross with a boat in 30 minutes. Yeah. So that's not, how do we keep people engaged, productive on their continent? Because they eventually add value to the entire world. And 
If you can't keep the young, I have business in Italy, so I understand what he's talking about. How do you keep the young Italians at home? Because internally within Europe itself, there is migration because yeah. of economic issues. So the same issues are playing across. So lead, we need leaders that are not just thinking about the politics of winning an election or remaining in power and thinking about self, but who understand that, look, do I want China to be the overriding foreign power on the continent of Africa? Mm -hmm. Personally, no. Not because uh, uh, China has a right to seek its own, and that's what they do. But do they always act in the best interest of my people and my continent? Not necessarily. How do, do we have leaders that engage more constructively on our behalf? That's a different thing. Do I think the Europeans and the Americans are based on governance and years of accountability, a little more are uh, able to do the right thing in terms of the continent, I would say yes. Not always, but a bit more. So there, there are many we'll things at it. play. <laughs> <laughs> we'll happily take that. Uh, um, I, I think it's fascinating to hear everybody talk about, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Identity is important. Yeah. And identity is something that comes up again and again. And I, I'm not an economist, but I do observe them like an anthropologist might. Um, I'm an anthropologist of economists. Um, and the last five years has shown that they're constantly surprised that people care about identity. And they'll, they'll look at people and they'll say, well, this is clearly not in your interest. And people will respond, well, yes, but we know what our interest is and this is what we want. And identity is uh, incredibly important. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, development. Uh, Jose Luis, you know, Argentina has, because of the innovations of fracking, a chance uh, at, to, to become uh, an, an oil exporter. Yeah. And this is the, uh, the Vaca Muerta field. Um, but you're also looking at uh, the possibility of recreating mistakes that other countries have made where when you get this oil wealth, you create uh, tremendous inequality. It's just something that, that has been identified all over the world for the last 40 years, uh, that it, it, it encourages inequality, it encourages graft, it makes, uh, it makes uh, non-tradable goods more expensive, um, and other sectors suffer. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? You're looking at this incredible wealth. How do you do it? How do you get it right? First, it's a, <clears throat> it's a good example of uh, the result of a change of information, people, and cooperation. Uh, we are investors in Baca Muerta. We are big investors in Baca Muerta. The first decision was made based on a US government paper that is public domain that explain entirely the basin, the relationship with Permian, the depth, the thickness of the formation is hundreds of millions of dollars of public information. So we went through that. That came from the first initial summit of the Americas Corporation Agreement on Energy. The information is in internet, you go into internet, you get it. Uh, that is absolute positive engagement. That is the way. I believe that is the way. With investing in lithium is the same. The best source is a energy uh, agency, which is multilateral. It's also the U.S. government. You go to the database, it's all there. Uh, then the example of the U.S. that it worked based on three things, market, <laughs> st stability of rules, and the non-existence of a national oil company. My theory is that if you don't have a national oil company, you become a champion. You have a national oil company, you lose production. No? And this is recent history. You look, uh, the Chavistas took it three million, they managed to get to 800,000 barrels, so it's a, it's a mm -hmm. clear example. Permian, there is no Texan oil company, no national oil company, they drop the price. So how Argentina will do? If we stay with some, we develop the basin, which is Vaca Muerta, with a populist government, but the resources belong to the provinces. And the provinces survive on royalties, and the people control is very close to the government. Since it's a local government, it's very close. It's even physically close. It's like if the state of Florida were the owner of the resource. So the money mostly go to schools, hospitals, roads. It's very close. And every two years there are local elections and they have to be accountable. In fact, it's a local, it's a local party. They just won the election two weeks ago. Close control. The communities engage. There are uh, local communities of, of uh, 
Indios that are called Mapuches, they have strong control, NGO, so it's closeness. So I don't, and there is a, obviously it's gonna be a windfall effect that I wish they create a fund. We are trying to have them to create a anti cyclical fund. We talk mm -hmm. about that all day. I don't know if they will take it. And we are lacking the entrepreneurship. We are lacking the, the juniors. Because the other thing is, the, the, the US miracle is thousands of companies. It cannot be seven national oil companies. Seven national oil companies will never transform Argentina into a big exporter. A big exporter should come from hundreds of people. You don't are, you are not the big exporter. There are hundreds of people investing and doing it. So we wish that the case. And it also has a, a political learning, uh, which is in this hotel, I believe it was President Clinton, we had a good summit of the America. The summit of the America that tried to push for uh, investment, exchange of information, cooperation, except freedom of moving of labor, all the rest. Then we had an awful summit of the Americas in Mar del Plata, in which Chavez managed to have the entire region going against President Bush. I felt embarrassed that day, it was awful. Uh, and after that, we went into high inflation and low growth in the entire region. So I think you, now you, mm -hmm. you can look back and say, what is the model? And now you have an opportunity again to, to engage through cooperation. Then how you deal with the Chinese factor, I believe through the multilaterals. I believe if you engage the Chinese through competitive bidding, multilateral rules, uh, you, you will find a way, it's the only idea I have, is you will find a way because you cannot say no to that money and you cannot let that money rule the country. The only way is through the multilaterals and engagement of the U.S. administration. This is U.S. administration is controversial, but they have a vision and they have a commitment toward the region. And that, that is better than no vision and no commitment. So I believe it's easy, cooperation, exchange of information, open exchange of technology and people. Alan, you know, we've been talking about this, this conflict between uh, where investment capital comes from. Does it come through uh, One Belt, One Road type initiatives from China? or general investment capital from China, or does it come from somewhere else? Um, you're, you're sitting here a representative of the private sector saying, I'm, I'm ready, we're, we're willing to invest in, in projects. What are the things that you need in terms of maybe getting governance right from uh, developing and developed countries to sort of make it possible for you to say, okay, here's an efficiency that I can find right there, that's where my capital goes. What do you need for them to do for you? Yeah. I I'd say a couple of things. Well, one is also what we can offer as a private sector, uh, but also what we need. So um, the first thing I'd say is, you know, investment um, in infrastructure for these, uh, whether it's energy or entrepreneurship um, in emerging markets, it comes in, it's, it's not just the physical, it's not just the structures and the capital, it's also intellectual. So, um, and by that there's uh, any number of frameworks that have been tested throughout the world for almost every problem that everybody encounters. And if you bring some sort of intellectual experience or capital to the table to help um, people avoid mistakes or groups um, accelerate their development of ideas to avoid reinventing the wheel, because a lot of times you don't have to reinvent the wheel, or at least elements of the wheel have already been uh, invented in the past, that is of value, and it's technological. So if you are bringing the best technologies from around the world that have also been tested through more data points or more exposure, uh, those things can also save time in the acceleration of the development of ideas. And so, um, you know, support and bringing these to the table are important. The other piece, you know, that, you know, in these conversations, obviously the horsepower is there from public sector investment, um, but then this question of motivations and identity and politics get involved. And, you know, from a private sector standpoint, what I can say is, you know, what, what we would strive for is you provide transparency about your motivations and you strive for neutrality, if not support, of ideas. Uh, and, and, and cultivating those things. And to me, that's forward momentum rather than um, pulling back the momentum of these ideas. And for us to step into um, a new market or a new idea or a new sector, um, you know, we, we do require global best practices, right? We want to see best in class governance. The creativity and entrepreneurship and intellectual capabilities are there 
anywhere. There's smart people everywhere in the world creating good ideas, but to have um, uh, the institutional governance and support around those ideas to know that there is a transparent path to uh, return and success in cultivating those ideas if we bring transparency and support and capital and intellect and technology to the table, then it's a very, I think, um, reciprocal relationship. And as Ibuka was saying, that ends up flourishing and bringing technology around the world and you're already a step closer to that because you have had this exchange with a transparent and neutral party. And so to me, that's the opportunity. Uh, and that's what we look for wherever we go. And we, um, you know, we look at emerging markets just as much as we look at developed markets. And having groups that are um, globally set and flexible and operating in those different types of environments uh, you know, creates a broader band for investment. And I think that's important too, to have groups and leaders who are flexible and can, you know, invest in Argentina, just does the same as they invest in the US. And that's, um, that's what we look for, so. Let me, um, Secretary Fan, there was some interesting consensus here on the panel. Um, there was a discussion of Chinese investment capital. Um, and I, I don't wanna paraphrase wrong, but it, it was essentially, uh, we don't necessarily want it, but we also can't say no. Um, and that's happening in Argentina, that's happening in Nigeria, that's happening in Italy. Um, as a representative of the United States, as a diplomat, how do you counter that? How do you answer when somebody says, we don't want investment capital from China necessarily, but we can't say no? What's the U.S. answer to that? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, I guess, <clears throat> first, I, I think it's important, because everyone, as you said, has spoken about the U.S.-China relationship, and I should probably do that. <laughs> uh, I guess, for, at the outset, I just want to make clear that the United States doesn't seek an adversarial relationship with, with China. And as you said, <clears throat> Countries need investment dollars. <clears throat> but what we are concerned about is how those investments occur. And one of the other things, the consensus, uh, all of the speakers here have all recognized the importance of transparency. <clears throat> we, well, that's exactly what we seek. We seek uh, transparent, uh, transparent processes. Um, the issues around resources, and I challenge you on the, the concept that resources necessarily catalyze uh, corruption, perhaps uh, the resource and wealth only makes it more so. What are the, pre the conditions that already exist all the more so? What we seek to do is address uh, those above ground conditions. Countries want to see a best in class miner or uh, investor uh, because they're operating uh, based on uh, the, the same standards that, that Alan was referring. It's important that countries recognize that when they're dealing with uh, a Chinese company, they're dealing with the government. There, there are some strings, however overt or not. Uh, but as you were explaining, when, when, when U.S. investment occurs, a company goes anywhere around the world, it's, the responsibility is to their shareholders. The responsibility is to their workers. It's, it's not to the government. Uh, it, so it's a, it's a fundamental distinction. What we're seeking to do is help countries around the world understand this distinction. And we're also developing new institutions within the US government to provide funding. Uh, recently, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation is going through a bit of a name change. Um, but we've elevated uh, more than doubling the, the, the funding available, removing strictures that are existing. Uh, now US can take equity stakes in projects around the world. Uh, so we're, we're, we're elevating uh, are, are the, really the dollars. But we're also seeking ways to leverage with other, uh, with other countries around the world who share our same values. And we're finding opportunities in concert with others. The, the US dollars aren't uh, there to just uh, for have a US project. They're there to catalyze private sector investment. Uh, and so those are some of the, the elements we're doing. We have programs all around the world doing this. And I welcome uh, discussions after. Let me, let me try and sum this up because we have uh, a minute left. Um, does one image that has stuck with me uh, is this idea of, uh, of mansions with walls with nothing on the outside. Um, and I think in the developed world, we do tend to look defensively, reactively to the rest of the world. Um, and to your point that 
migration is going to happen. It's a human urge. You're going to go to the place where you have the greatest opportunity. Um, that necessarily, uh, if you want to protect your mansion, you have to go make sure that there's a verdant garden on the other side of the wall. And that that's, 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 those are two parts of the same strategy. I think the other thing that came out that I heard from everybody was this idea of governance. Again, economists are, they tend to, or until recently, they've tended to say, look, we're gonna take care of growth. You guys take care of the rest. You guys make sure the distribution works out. Um, but as we've seen, again, in both developed and developing countries, that's not how it worked out. It didn't happen that way. And so um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think that everybody would agree that governance is growth. If you can get the governance right, the growth will follow. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody on the panel. Everybody a round of applause. Um,